Peter, it is so good to have you on my podcast and to see your lovely face. Finally, right? <laughs> right? Right? We've only been trying to do this for like a year and a half. Yeah. That pandemic ruined everything. I know. How dare it? How dare that? Glad it's it. over. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. Well, and and that's really one of the one of the things I love about this podcast is that I can connect with people like you that I haven't seen in a while because it's been like twenty years yeah. since we've been face to face in the yeah. same room. Yeah. And so, what would you say? I mean, because you were obviously acting before then, but what would you say has been your longevity that's kept you going? both as an actor on stage and on screen? Wow, that's a good, that's a good question. You didn't tell me you were going to ask that. Um, <laughs> I, I don't know. I think, I think part of it is I've been lucky enough to meet some great people. I think that helps anybody in the industry, people that believe in you and get you work. I think um, I'm, I'm a weird actor who loves to get notes, so I'm always looking to improve, right? And then... Um, I feel like we have to always reinvent ourselves as things happen and change. You know, I, I've worked for the Disney corporation, you know, we all worked at Disney in Florida together. And then I worked out here at Disney and I've done Japan Disney. Um, and I work for universal. I do an improv show at universal, but I also was a host for God. I've been at universal out here for 20 years and I've been working as a host for them for 15 of those years, as well as hosting, in different clubs here in LA, as well as performing in film and TV and movie, you know, doing all that other stuff. But it's it's nice to have that like one core, because I remember when I was in Orlando for nine years, it's nice to have that core job that you have that pays the bills, and then you can bounce around and do these other gigs that fulfill your creative side. Yeah, you know, it's funny, right? From the people that we met at Tokyo Disney Sea, uh, I connected with a couple of people from LA. So when I came back, I did not jump right back into the world of film and TV as much, but oddly enough, survived for almost two years doing professional theater in LA, which is rare. Yeah, um, that's tough to do in LA. Not a huge theater town, but some of the connections I made from Disney, and that's the other thing is I'm ready to meet anybody, talk to anybody, just ready to just, I'm a really bad networker in the sense of selling myself. Right. But I certainly have enjoyed supporting other people. And from that have garnered some good friends. And one of the guys that saw us all performing there uh, ran a Shakespeare company here in LA and for a few years kept me employed. How about that? So it was yeah, great. I, will, I will say that that's not one of my strong suits either is the networking. So yeah, yeah. Cause it's difficult to sell yourself and not, at least for me, not feel like I'm coming across like an arrogant asshole, you know? Right. And so, I mean, not to jump ahead, but why I'll never make it is a bad networker, <laughs> right? Exactly, exactly. No, that's that's one of my deficiencies as well. But but you mentioned it as far as part of that longevity is the people that you've networked with or people that have helped you along your career. So, in what ways, even though you're bad at it, in what ways have you been able to utilize that? I think, I think. I've always had believed in if you really work hard, it should pay off, right? I'm like one of those people. And um, I think that I was lucky enough, I guess lucky or, you know, fortune smiled on me that there were certain people that I met that enjoyed that, that saw that in me, enjoyed my work, liked my dedication, and um, gave me that opportunity to keep moving forward. You know, I mean, Gary Marshall is a huge part of that. Um, not just putting me in movies, but I also performed at his theater a lot, doing uh, plays and musicals. And um, uh, my brother, which I know will bring up my twin, I should <laughs> bring that in an awful way. <laughs> but my twin and I, Paul, you know, um, Gary produced a, we did a two man improv show with this amazing woman, Rachel Lawrence, who is, uh, she's funny but she also is one of the top vocal coaches here in LA and she's massively talented. And so she, she was our music director. Paul and I put together a show. We would have a guest star each time. Uh, the one time we had Mo Collins who was with all of us at Disney. Love her. Yeah. And then the other was um, my friend Edie, who everyone knows from the gemstones now she's uh, Judy gemstone but we've been close friends for years and she was our other guest star for, for when we did the run. So Gary believing in you and supporting someone that high up. And when you do that show, 
the people that show up to see it, you know, and that gives you that credit, you know, when you do something, when you mm -hmm. perform with somebody, when your name starts getting out there, all of a sudden people want to work with you and you haven't changed anything. It's just, it's the exposure, I guess, is the best way to put it, especially here in LA. I know, I think in New York, it might be a little different because I feel like it's so compact there in New York and everybody knows each other in a way that theater is theater and blah, 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 blah. You know, we're here in LA. It's like, we're so spread out that people are like, where'd you come from? Or they'll meet me and they'll be like, you're great. We love you. I've done a bunch of original shows and stuff. And then they'll be like, oh, you have a brother. Is he in the business? <laughs> a little bit, a little bit, a little bit, a little, little tiny bit. Yeah. But um, I, I feel that happens more to us when, you know, I lived in New York for a while. I lived in Queens and worked at Ellen Stardust Diner. Mm -hmm. There's a little bit for everybody. Um, in the very early days before before it is what it was now. But um, I did like a national tour out of uh, New York and I did a lot of improv in New York and then actually came back to Florida. So I started in in Buffalo. We're originally from Buffalo, moved down to Florida. I went to New York, moved back down and then came to LA. So I think it's just that I said before, like the reinvention, but it's also when I started out, I wanted, I ran a theater company when I was like 19 hmm. at a theater company and we did musicals. We did you know, Runaways, Liz Suedo's musical. She's from Buffalo. We did the first Western premiere of it. Um, I was in college at the time, but we we were the first time that we used high school students, college students. We did all of this great stuff. My brother was the director. I produced it. I was in it. We kept doing stuff like that. But for some reason, along the way, I lost that sight that you can do all of that. You can be a writer and an actor. And did I thought you just had to be, a, a, I can only be a performer, right? Yeah, I mean, there is something to be said for for finding your lane and sticking with it. But but I think over the last, I would say, especially 10 years or so, and probably even going back further, but definitely the last 10 years, there's just more of this emphasis on being able to do it all and having, yeah, yeah, yeah not just that triple threat. That's always kind of been a thing. But now you want to be able to write and produce and improv. And there's so many different skills to keep acquiring. Well, like what you're doing, doing your podcast, creating your own content that then people see, this is your exposure. People see this, they're introduced to you, they discover you, and now you're going to get other things from it. You know what I'm saying? Like That's the hope, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. But that's that wasn't when we started out in this industry. That's not anything that we knew. I didn't know that I had to learn how to work a computer, get my sound right, videotape myself for an audition. I know the whole self-tape thing, yeah. It, and even with the pandemic, it's just gotten crazier and crazier. Like I, uh, for voiceovers, you know, I had a great voiceover agent. And when the pandemic hit, they were like, you just don't have the right equipment. And now that we're in a pandemic, all these great, amazing people have invested in home studios and we're dropping everyone who doesn't have one. So I have to not, you know, I'm regrouping and I'm not, I'm also a person who takes the punches and doesn't lay down. Like, I'm regrouping. I'm going to get myself back into that stream of uh, performing again. I love doing voiceover work, but because of the pandemic, those of us who couldn't afford these, you know, hyperlinks and expensive studios and private rooms and stuff, they dropped a ton of us. A lot of agents mm. dropped a lot of people because it was at one time, it was the one thing that was surviving through the beginning, if you remember was the one thing that people could do at home that they'd already been doing at home that everyone knew how to do at home. You know, I, I have several successful voiceover friends who have converted their garages into amazing studios and stuff like that. And I was doing the blanket over my head. <laughs> Right. No, no, there was a while when I had this microphone in a closet surrounded by clothes, just trying to, you know, do the right sound. No, 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 no. It's so it's, it's taken me a while to, I guess, give in to this new way of auditioning, this new way of being my own technical and uh, artistic director, so to speak, when it yeah. comes to auditioning. Yeah, it's great. It's hard, but I think once you can accept that and start doing it, it's great, but it's still, you know, every time we try something like that, we're always starting at the bottom and having to work our way back up, right? Yeah. Like I wrote a kid's book and I'm trying to get it published and people are loving the book, but I can't get it, anyone to publish it. 
Uh, I've come up with some show ideas and concepts and I've written those out. Now I'm just trying to get them to the right people to get that stuff produced, but I'm nobody, you know? It's, it's, it really is crazy how, how much we need each other in this business. I, mean, I think you bring up a good point that there's always that someone out there, that someone that has an in, has an avenue that we just don't have access to. So there's, there's always this need for someone else in our business. Yeah. And I think I've learned instead of being angry when I see people succeeding, I get inspired now. And I think that's one of the biggest mm. changes for me because yeah. I used to be angry. It's tough. You know, it's, do. And jealous, of course. Yeah, and you're jealous. Or you see someone, you're like, they don't deserve that. And it's like, well, it's not up to me to decide that. But I can say, wow, they worked really hard and look what they got. I'm being lazy. It's not going to be handed to me. I got to earn it, right? So even though I've written stuff and I'm doing video auditions and I'm, I'm trying to get myself back out there, it's up to me to do it if one of my friends who have made it to a different level can help me and want to, that's great. But they didn't become famous to make me successful. They became famous because that's what they chose to do. And they were hardworking and they earned it. I'm, we, you know, we were talking about the networking thing. What I'm really bad at is reaching out to those friends who are successful that could possibly help me. Yeah. And I refuse to ask them those questions because that's not why I'm friends with them. And I've just recently started doing that with some of the projects I've been trying to work on. And, and you know, we start with, look, I never do this. And <laughs> right. if you don't want to continue this conversation, let me know. But I've written a thing. Can right. you you know, because that's something that I've I've met people through this podcast, very well known people, as well as people that I've worked with on stage and on screen. But when you've approached them, what is their usual response? Have you gotten the eye roll, or have you gotten people willing to hear you out? Um, I would say the majority of people have uh, participated in some way, shape, or form. Some it's taken a little. You know, we all want it tomorrow. You know. If I sent you my, if I sent you my book for you to read, I want to know that you read it tonight. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. And tell me about everything tomorrow. A five paragraph essay, all the yeah, likes exactly. and don't like. How it. dare you have a life now that you said <laughs> yes to something? Um, so I think we need at least I've learned that people will do it in their time. If they say yes, then and I've also learned to check back. Hey, it's been a week. You said you were gonna do this. Is it cool? You know, have you done it? Because I value their opinion you know what i'm saying it's like i want to know what they think because i think that they have insight and with the book that i wrote it's really really helped a lot i've chose a few good people and um only one one person i approached the first time totally helped me out second time they literally ignored the question about the book and just went so what's going on how are you and i went <laughs> message received right they pivoted and yeah you... and they're an author they're a playwright there's yeah. someone i highly respect so because i do respect them <laughs> right then you just move on yeah and we just moved on and we are still the best of friends and i love him very much and i i took the very polite subtle hint of i'm not reading your stupid book <laughs> <laughs> Certainly before COVID, you were actually involved with a couple of projects out there in LA. And there, there were two very different kinds of musicals. One was the classic 1776. And the other was a new musical, Grumpy Old Men, a stage adaptation of that movie. And so how was it transitioning from one character type to another? First of all, great question, Patrick Thanks. Alex Jones. Three names. Um, <laughs> or POJ as we call you. Yes, of course. Um, what I loved about that is it was McCoy Rigby, who is an amazing group of people. It's Kathy Rigby. It's Kathy yeah. Rigby. I've, I've auditioned before. for them. I've been out there. Oh, I've have, auditioned. Yeah. Honestly, fabulous people. They're wonderful, wonderful people. Tom McCoy, boy, he's a driven man. And Kathy Rigby couldn't be more sweet and fun. She's far more talented than I think anybody gives her credit for. Um, as an actress, as a performer. And then on top of that, she's Olympic, Olymp an Olympian. Right? Yeah. Like, what? So 
Uh, Glenn Casal was our director for 1776. Oh, he's wonderful. Yeah, he's a wonderful director. And it, what was so sweet about him is that he, I'd auditioned, as you said, I've auditioned a ton for them out there. Um, and when we say out there, for those who are listening here in LA, we're in LA County and this production is in Orange County. So it's about a 45 minute drive yeah. to get to them, but super worth it. So I've auditioned for him several times, never quite got in. Tons of my friends have worked with them and you know, tons of famous people. I mean, they get the Broadway right. people, right? So Glenn has always wanted to work with me and my brother together or separately, but he's always admired us, always enjoyed our work. So finally this project came up. I went in, of course, I wanted to be, you know, molested to run slaves guy because I'm that guy. <laughs> and um, I became uh, the guy who kind of saves the day. What was nice about it is the cast was this amazing, just everybody a lead. Do you know what I mean? Like, well, that's how 1776 is kind of built, that everyone has their standalone yeah. part. Yeah, Everyone has their standalone part. And the great thing about how Glenn directed it was that we really needed to identify and listen to each other. So we're not just sitting on stage waiting for our line, but we're really participating in the moment, right? And um, we all had our business. We all had our thing that we were doing. And, uh, you know, our lead was, he was so, Andy was so amazing to watch. And uh, the way it was staged, you know, the first, God, the f I think it's, we're on stage for 45 minutes, maybe 50 minutes before there's a break, before there's a song, like we sit, sing, sit down, John, and then it's like 45 minutes of dialogue. There's another song. You had to keep things going. But also <laughs> you had to be active and listening, but not draw attention, right? And that's, that was a beautiful thing. But what was amazing was this cast was so, amazing to watch but my character I got to play was very much a um just a solid character I do a lot of comedy and 1776 isn't a comedy show you know it's not wacky wacky funny like Franklin can be funny but for the right reasons because he's witty not because he's a a cartoon character and what I what I was really um pleased by was that Glenn was able to see that I could perform that way, allow me to perform that way. And even though I had like bits where I had a turkey leg, like my character is always eating something and I made a point of using the food in my actions and stuff like that. But when you have these bigger stars, to use a term, coming up to you afterwards and saying, I can't take my eyes off of you. You're, you're so amazing in this part. And even when reviews came out, I would get singled out as somebody to watch. Like if you're going to watch this show, check out what Peter Allen Vogt is doing. His stuff is really solid, which wow. was great. I'm not saying that to brag. What I'm saying is to add to what you're saying is I went from that where I was able to deliver this really nice, solid performance to this really goofy character in, you know, grumpy old men that Blake Hammond played at, at Algonquin which oh, is right weird. yeah and blake hammond i think is do you know blake i mean he's, yeah i worked with him out of his family yeah oh yeah there you go i mean he's so amazingly talented and just the fact that i mean i'm so glad he was busy and he couldn't do the show <laughs> right <laughs> right but also to be in the same company as blake is an honor to me because i think he is amazing he's the sweetest sweetest guy in the world and so to be able to do this part with that the cast was unbelievable and to be the comedy guy and go from 1776 where I'm being a serious character although moments of humor but being able to play that seriousness which I'm not afforded a lot back into my funny 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 role of being yeah. able to be this guy who can't feel anything because of this weird accident that he had and his hands are getting smashed and people are hitting him with stuff and he doesn't feel anything and doing bits with like Ken Page and Mark Jacoby. I mean, my God, singing a, a song with Hal Linden. I mean, <laughs> right. You're just, what you, I was just an idiot through the whole thing. And everyone else is like, no, that's fun. I'm like, no, you don't understand. You don't understand. Like, no, is what? Well, yeah. I'm sure you felt like, you know, a kid at the playground. It's like yeah. everything was fun. Well, and God, you know, Ken Page, Ken Page, Ken Page amazing right me mark jacoby i shared a dressing room with that man and he like 
when we get to who do you admire? Oh, Mark Yeah. He's yeah. amazing. He's wonderful. And I, I've known of him and I followed him in ragtime. Like I saw him in the original cast with all the original people with music that some people don't know because we watched it in Toronto. We saw the original. Oh, original. Yeah. yeah. I told him that. And he was like, all right, you're freaking me out. You're scaring me. Please leave. <laughs> <laughs> Taking pictures of him. And he's like, and he's, he's a very stoic man. But when you make him laugh, that's the greatest moment. And I would make him giggle all the time. And it was sort of, uh, but his talent, boy. So yeah, so that's that was the beautiful thing about playing these two different diverse characters, and the fact that the people at McCoy Rigby saw that in me, and yeah, I could will- see both sides of you. Yeah, yeah. That, that that says something about casting and the directors that they could pull out those different parts of you. I mean, because you, you've you played a, a lot of comedic roles, you know, of, over your that that that's been your bread and butter, so to speak. Yeah, but, absolutely. So, would you say that that is your favorite kind of character to play? Um, it is. I mean, I don't mind. I like playing dramatic stuff if it's the right stuff. Um, you know, I was lucky enough to get. Uh, in the, I'm in the first season of American Horror Story, hmm. and um, I get to kill somebody. Whoa. Yeah, Eric Stone Street from Modern Family. <laughs> right? I shoot him in the head. I shoot him in the head. Um, and that day was an amazing day. And um, I wouldn't say like Eric and I are best buddies, but we've known each other for years. So the fact that we were able to work on a, on a show together was really exciting. You know, sadly, the world of TV and movies, a lot of what I did got cut. But the fact that I got cast in the show and for what I did in that show opened up a whole new realm of auditions for me. Hmm. As people saw on my resume, I did American Horror Story and had a darker side to me. I started getting these better opportunities to be the mean guy or the heavy in things where, you know, usually I'm like, hey, I'm wacky guy, you know, <laughs> which I love, which I love. You know, I've gotten to work with amazing people. I worked with Jamie Foxx and Valentine's Day, you know, Molly Shannon. And when she did Kath and Kim and Jim, you know, Michael Higgins, just amazing, amazing people and doing comedy. And even here in L.A., you know, we have the Groundlings and both Paul and I have been uh, invited to do Cooking with Gas, which is their Thursday night show where they invite a guest to come in and improvise with all of these amazing people that you see. Oh, that sounds fun. Yeah. Yeah, it's brilliant. And um, so I love doing the comedy. I love making people laugh. But I do like being able to to get back to those performing roots of Shakespeare and Chekhov and Ibsen, what I was trained in when I went to college and stuff like that. But for me, I mean, give me a good, let me be Marcellus in, you know, Music Man for the next 20 years and I'm happy. You know, <laughs> I've done that role so many different times. So it's like, I love that. It's fun. It's up. It's a positive show. It's just, you know. Yeah. And a lot of the, uh, the roles, you know, especially these comedic roles have used your weight as the punchline or part of the joke. Now, has, has there ever been a time where a particular script or show took it too far? Maybe. Oh, do I answer this? Will people oh, of course. Yeah. Does Ryan Murphy listen to your show? <laughs> <laughs> if he does, welcome. Hello, Ryan. How are you? Um, I would. I mean, this is definitely not a slam to Ryan Murphy, but I was called a few times for Glee. My brother did an episode of Glee, and I have to say, the great thing about the casting for them is, even though my brother did an episode of Glee, that didn't cross me out of being able to go in an audition for them. But what happened was, I started getting calls to be the sight gag for being so heavy. Hmm. So it wasn't even about acting. It was just like, we need a fat guy, Peter Spun, come in and read for us this part. It maybe was one line. Sometimes it was nothing. Sometimes it was just fat guy gets up from chair. Sue, you know, comes in and says, oh, I like when a fat person, I steal a fat person's chair, it's always warm. Like that stuff, no, I'm not doing that. Um, I did a TV show called The Loop, which uh, dealt with the fact that I was a heavy guy who was fighting for the rights of fat people on planes. And that writing was very funny. It did not bother me. It did not in any way, shape or form degrade being a big person, but you needed to be a big person to deliver the lines to make it funny. makes sense. Yeah. Like uh, there's a diner, a dinner scene and I'm ordering from the waitress and I order, I ask what the vegetables, steamed vegetables of the day are and she lists a bunch. And I just look at her and I go, of the curly fries. 
And, you know, it was well written and well delivered in great direction. So, um, but yeah, there have been times that I'm like, yeah, I'm not doing that just because I'm a big guy. I'm not going to go in for that role or where they're like, oh, we need someone fat to take their shirt off. I'm like, no, nope, no reason for it. I'm not going to do it, you know? So I've been lucky enough that I can do that. Maybe I don't, maybe I should have. And I would be sitting in my mansion. <laughs> You'd be talking to my butler. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Now, did that in any way lead you to want to lose the weight that you've lost? In a way, I felt that with the way things were going in the world, and this is this is uh, pre-pandemic craziness, but I'm a big believer in the diversity. I believe that everyone should have a chance at parts. As a character guy, as the sidekick, as the best friend, as a secondary character, I felt like these characters are getting more replaced with diversity, which is fine, but I also feel like it's a safe choice. You know, I've always said, where's Leslie Odom Jr. as the music man, right? Where's yeah. he as the lead? Wouldn't that be great, yeah. Show me as the lead him, right? Not the secondary guy being a diverse character. Let's put the leads up there in these shows. Uh, so I felt like I was getting to the point where as I got older, I mean, I'm 107 now. I know. I look you look great. great, though. Thank you. Yes. <laughs> Uh, yep, yeah, yep. Yeah, tuck it I in. The, tuck it in. I know the people can't see this on the podcast, but they could hear my skin sagging. <laughs> uh, so I just felt it was time to to lose weight, and and as I lost weight, I mean, sadly, right before the pandemic, I you know I did Grumpy Old Men, and then I was able to do a movie, and I got uh, a new show on Netflix. I was in as a guest star. And there was a Disney movie that was going to be done that I was being asked to do. So all these great things were starting to happen. And I think it's because with having lost some weight, it made me less of, you know, in Hollywood, I'm still the fat guy. I'm still a fat guy in Hollywood, right? I'm 5'11", 260. I don't mind saying that now. Hmm. But um, that's still really fat in Hollywood, right? So imagine me 200 pounds heavier, like, hold it, like they would be like, we don't know what to put you in. I'm like, well, I don't wear a poncho. I'm not walking into auditions wearing like a garbage bag. A moo. So there are clothes for me, yeah. right? And, uh, but I remember also feeling great when I went to this TV show to get my costume fitting and some of the stuff they pulled was too big. And I was like, ah. oh, like, well, oh, this yes. isn't it. Right. What a good feeling that is. So a lot of it is was for me, I wanted to feel better. I wanted to feel like I was making a positive move. Given this crazy time in our lives for everybody, this was my positive thing. Like I literally work out on a treadmill every day, do about five miles. And then a couple of days a week, I get on the elliptical, I swim. Because even if nothing else happens in the day, if I do that, I've accomplished something. Right. And it keeps me positive. <laughs> well yeah i mean the just the need just right? the physicalness of, of those endorphins from working keeps you positive but then also that sense of accomplishment as you said yeah i feel like okay i've done something today and then it makes me want to do more you know then i i feel like i get more done so i mean i know some people are like you don't need to work out every single day but for me that's what i need right now i've been doing this for about this july it'll be three years that i've started really really focusing on this and it's so funny because both Paul and I have yo-yoed our weight. We've done crazy things, not crazy things. And this is, this is, sounds so dumb, but this is the first time that I've done it where I've watched what I'm eating and worked out, kept a journal of what I'm eating, how many calories, thinking about how I feel after you eat certain things. Right. If I know I want to, like, like if I know I'm going to go out with a bunch of people and we're going to have stuff to like when I was hosting and I wanted to have some wine, that was a day that I knew I had to work out a little bit more. Like I never understood that from friends who were always thin and said, you know, oh, if I'm going to have fries today, I better do an extra three miles on the treadmill or something. I'd be like, why? <laughs> Just have. Oh, I'm that guy. No, I'm that idiot. <laughs> yeah. Like ice cream. Hang on a second. Boop, 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 boop. Okay, I got to swim eight more laps. <laughs> <laughs> now, I'm curious. Conversely, did losing the weight affect the kind of roles that you were being seen for? Not, not yet, because 
most of the shots I had of me were from when I'm heavy. And of course my reel is all from when I was heavy, when I was in Hannah Montana and all the stuff I've done. So I think there are people that are still thinking I'm that guy. I have a lot of casting people who know me. Some even follow me on my Instagram and Facebook, but still haven't clicked in that, oh, you're not that heavy anymore. Because I've been getting auditions for parts where it's like, he's a really, really heavy guy who does, who's fun. And I'm like, okay. Like I had an audition for, they wanted him to be like John Candy big. And I was like, oh, I'm not. Mm. But like I said, I still think I still read big, Hollywood big. I'm still a big guy. You know, I'm not, I don't think that I'm like, I'm not no Patrick Oliver Jones. <laughs> Well, believe me, COVID has uh, put on put on a little bit of weight for me. Oh, please. Well, 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 no, I mean, just saying, we're all in our own space, I you know, know, depending. I always but... get mad at, I always get mad at you thin, attractive people when you say that. <laughs> <laughs> I get that. I get that. And And I've learned that you're right. It is what your world is. It's not my vision of what I think you should be. It's who you are and how you feel. Yeah. I've grown up a lot, Patrick. You have. Look at you. You've I'm matured. I'm 107. Yeah, 107. You're you're going to learn a lot in those years. Oh, good wine. Drink me. <laughs> well, your your bottle of wine also comes in an identical flavor. Oh, God. Uh, yeah, right. Did you like that transition? Was that good? Good. It was, it was good. smooth. It was I smooth like, like my wine. Um, and you've brought up Paul a couple of times, and I'm. It it must be interesting having someone who's. I mean. Having an identical twin is one thing, but this identical twin does the same kind of stuff that you do, is a comedian, is an actor. And so have you ever been up for the same role? Like, how's that crossover worked? Um, we have actually a lot. It's interesting because there, there's an ebb and flow to us when we do things um, that sometimes, you know, people think we're like around each other all the time and stuff. And I'm like, we don't, you know, you live, you, live down the block you know he's right around the corner but it doesn't mean that we talk all the time or see each other all the time he has his life I have my life so there have been a few times that we've auditioned for things I think there's been a couple of times that I know there was one thing that we both auditioned for and I know I, I know I booked it but I think at the time he was doing to a con and that might have been one of the reasons that he wasn't like in town or able to do it I don't know or I was just so much better Yes, you surpassed um, him. Yes. Uh, but also, you know, I mean, since we are bringing him up, you know, he's been so successful with doing uh, Hairspray. You know, he did it on Broadway. Um, and then he's been like their go-to Edna for so many things. He's been all, like, he's done it up in Sacramento. He's done it in Texas. He's done it in St. Louis. They did this big celebration of the of Hairspray in Baltimore with John Waters and he played Edna there. He was in Hairspray Live and he was actually, you know, would stand in for Harvey Firestein when he couldn't be there. And like he, he's really established himself in that world. And it's an amazing group of people and he's amazing, you know? And then on top of that, Chicago, you know, he did Chicago twice on Broadway and has done the national tour of Chicago to the point where he, he even went to Israel with it when they did that right before the pandemic. So, He's also been gone. <laughs> right. It's been kind of nice. Right, right. It, it leaves space for the other, the, the other vote to take exactly. it. And they'll go, who's Paul? And they're like, nobody. Sha, sha. But um, <laughs> so, yeah, there's been times that we've been up against each other. There are times because of his credits and his relationship with people, he's been called and I haven't. There's been times I get called and he doesn't. I mean, being identical twins doesn't guarantee you either one of us, the part or the audition. I think sometimes it helps us, sometimes it, it goes against us. Um, way back in Orlando, we auditioned for a visa commercial. I went in to the callback. They said, oh, give it to us this way. And I did it. They're like, that's great. And then he went in and they said, give it to us this way. And he did it that way. And they decided they liked that way better, but never gave either one of us the opportunity to do it the other way. Right. So lucky for him, he ended up booking a national commercial because Apparently, I couldn't do it that way. <laughs> right. This is our business. Yeah, exactly. So, and I think that happens with anybody. Like, that could happen to any one of us. But, yeah, there are times that uh, I'm sure 
it's riled us and and I try to just be as supportive as I can. Again, it's it's difficult because you see this other person who looks just like you succeeding. Yeah. And you're like, why isn't it me? But then you have to really identify it's like because he has different work ethics and he has different contacts and he has different ways of doing things and and he's great. I mean, it's not like he's not great. He's great. So he just got into this great stream and boom, just took off with it, which is wonderful. Yeah. And you had mentioned before about, about seeing other people being famous. Was it harder with your brother seeing him succeed in these different areas? I mean, yeah, honestly, there were times that were, it was harder, but the underlying was always great. I mean, of course it's like, cause you love him. I mean, they're, they're still, he's still your brother. Let's not go that far. Okay, well, you put up oh, with yeah. him. He's your brother. You put up with him. We deal with each other well. <laughs> um, yeah, exactly. I mean, of course, I mean, I'm never going to sit there and go, I'm 100% happy that he is like that. Um, of course, we're humans. Of course, I would love to have done Edna on uh, Broadway. I got to audition for the show as well for um, the tour. I can't even remember if it was before, after, I think it was before he did it or around the time that he got it, but his stuff was so much better. I mean, he just, he just knew how to audition better than I did. And, and that's what I needed to learn watching him. And plus he went to school, we went to two different schools in Buffalo. I went to the University of Buffalo. He went to the college and he took directing. And I think that really, really, he's a great director. Mm really really good eye a lot of people don't know that he's a really good eye he's very critical but boy he 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 sees stuff and i think he learned to utilize that talent for himself in his auditioning and i think that that's really uh been detrimental for myself where i needed to really learn how to be more discerning and even more creative like sometimes he'll tell me about what he did in audition and i'll be like i would have never thought to do that like it's really funny stuff. Right. Auditioning is really its own skill and it's yeah. a way of of you know the page or two that you get to pull something out that something else isn't going to see. And he's really great at that. And he's and I've learned when he tells me those things, I don't go, oh, that's so, I'm so angry. I'm like, oh, okay, next time we get an audition, I'm gonna start doing that stuff. So that's what I mean by being inspired instead of being angry. Yeah. I can't be angry, that's his path in life, you know. Uh, the comment that makes me crazy that anybody says is that was my part. You took my part. <laughs> we all, everyone said it, right? No, if it was your part, you'd be doing it. Right. Like, and also I don't care how many people you looked at before you gave me the role. You gave me the role. Now it's my role. Right. Right. It's as simple yeah. as that. Like you see all these stories about how many people auditioned to be Han Solo. You know what I'm saying? Like you have these audition tapes that you can look at out of all these people that audition for all these famous roles. And we all are that, you know, rarely do you get somebody who just walks up to you and says, you're doing this role. I wrote this part for you. We have that musical, we have the fellowship parody. That was a show that um, Joel McCreary and Kelly Holden were hanging out one day and we started going back, back and forth with each other saying, movies that should should ne I don't know if it was movies that should be musicals or should never be musicals and started throwing things back and forth it was a game that you know it's like an improv game and when they got to Lord of the Rings they started going wait we could cast this and started thinking of all the people they could cast it was all of us that had known each other from Orlando and a few of us that had gathered together here in LA and had been performing together and literally wrote the show the basic of the show with all of us in mind for certain roles. And then as the show grew, we would come in and improvise our scenes based on the dialogue they'd already written. And then, which I thought was kind of brilliant of them, if you were in a song, then you were part of helping create that song. Right, because I, I see in the breakdown of the credits and everything, like there's all these lyricists. So that's so that's all the actors giving and collaborating on that particular Twelve song. Of us? <laughs> It's a cast of nine plus, and Kelly's in the cast. So it's a 12 of nine, but then Kelly, Joel, and Alan Simpson, who was our music director, and Joel was our director creator guy. We all have rights. <laughs> so we all, and, and 
it's to different degrees, obviously, Kelly and Joe own the biggest parts, but we all have rights in the writing because we all created the bits and stuff that we put down on paper. And then like, I play Sam. So the four hobbits plus Joel and Alan wrote our hobbit songs. Mm. So you have those six people. And then I played the Balrog, which is just me. It's just a solo song. And I mess with the audience. It's like one of the best number, like it was a gift from God. And I thank them every day for it. Um, it was a number that probably should have lasted two minutes and always lasted about seven to 10. Um, but I'm sure it brought the house down. It was very fun. People seem to enjoy it. Let's yes. say that. Yeah. But that was just Joel, myself, Kelly, and Alan. So just the four of us own the rights to that. You know, So it worked like that. But that's a great example of they saw this group of people. And the year that we did the show, we were these new upstarts and ended up winning all the awards in LA for it. They used to do the LA Weekly Awards and Sally Kellerman was the MC. <laughs> She was in a show. They did the wild party. Oh, okay. Right? And they thought they were going to win everything. Daisy Egan was in it. Sally Kellerman was in it. Um, I don't know if you know Eric Anderson. He was in it. And he and they were all hosting the show. And everybody assumed that this was the show that was winning everything. And every time the category came up, we would win. <laughs> Sally Kellerman eventually just got to the point where she was like, and the winner for this one is... Are you kidding me? <laughs> so, but it was just joyful and it was such a great thing. But that to have a part that you originated mm -hmm. and then for almost 10 years, we did that show in different venues and different places. And we had different people coming in and out of the show. It was just the best and just the best group of people. And when it comes to those kind of improv roles, you also did one on screen as well with The Fur is Gone. And this was, uh, you know, backstage, you know. But, but so so you're a group of, of actors doing a show and basically the show is what happens backstage, right? Yeah, it was um, it was almost like a mockumentary of what happens backstage of a, of a theater company. And um, it was with this great theater company out here called the uh, Co-op. And we were doing a production of Edwin Drood, which, you know, it's so funny because I know one of the questions you have is um, a dream role that you want to do. And one of them was the chairman and I got to do it. And um, so I was the chairman in this amazing production with, again, an amazing group of people. But behind the scenes, everybody was so funny and stuff. So they had done this, I forget the, they did a production just prior to this show. And it was Lend Me a Tenor was the original. Production yes, so they did Lend Me a Tenor. And they did, they found, because everyone's so funny and great, they started doing this behind the scenes mockumentary thing. And a lot of the people from Lend Me a Tenor were in my, in Edwin Drood. So they continued it and we were added as characters. And basically they would just say, let's do this scene now. And we would create these made up storylines very dramatic, very overblown drama. I think, I want to say somebody got murdered. I mean, we were coming up with ridiculous stuff and it was so much fun because half the time it'd be like, oh wait, I have a cue, I have to get on stage. So, so it was literally <laughs> during the show. show. Yes. Oh my gosh. Oh my gosh. So on top of me being an idiot backstage and for some reason during that time, because we did the show in the fall, I would bring in so much candy corn and versions of candy corn and flavors of candy corn that that was like the highlight of the day that I would show up and be like, these are maple butterscotch candy corns. And then we just would go crazy. So yeah, it's a very, very funny series. I think there's three seasons and I think I'm mostly in season two and probably part of season three, I think. Yeah. It was years ago. Again, I'm 107. So. Right, right. How dare you ask me to go back? So dare far. you ask me about something when I was young? Yes, yes. Well, I think it's great though that you've been able to balance this this work as as both an improv and kind of making up, creating these characters and bits, in addition to the work that you've done with more scripted. Is yeah. is there one that if you could like direct your path, is there one way you'd go over the other? It's 
Oh, that's a good question. You're good at this. You should do this. You should make this a show. I, I, um, I think I might. <laughs> um, it, that's such a great question because what I do at Universal here at the theme park here is um, we do this thing called New York Window. And it's, you know, it's what I, it, it's interactive improv, which means my definition. We have established characters. Um, as you know, Streetmosphere, what we used to do in Florida. Right. Is we have an established character. I was here, we're New Yorkers. We moved from Brooklyn because we love the Dodgers. And the Dodgers used to be in Brooklyn and now they're the LA Dodgers. We know we're in LA. Our building was taken by Universal to use on a movie set and we came with it because it was rent controlled. So we're not people who live in the 50s who don't know it's 20 whatever. We know where we are and everything, but we live our life like we're, you know, from the 50s. So I'm in a t-shirt and I got the fedora on and I'm like yelling out the window and that's my wife over there. And we're like, hey, how's it going? What's going on? But everything is very much like, we love those Brooklyn bums. You know, we do stuff like that and that's fun. But when you're doing that seven days, you know, all the time and someone hands you a script and you're like, wait, I just have to do these words. Right, I don't have to think up anything. Nice. Yeah. It's nice. Um, you know, the challenge for people who do things like the Groundlings when they do their shows and sat comedy in Orlando, you know, that constant, when we used to do the Comedy Warehouse, that was five improv shows a night, seven days a week. Mm. And it's Disney, so you can't go blue. So you, right, you know, right. you got to keep it clean, oh. family friendly. Family friendly. And everybody, the easiest thing to do is to go blue. And people would shout horrible things out to us and we had to take it yes. and make it oh boy, it's fun. Right. You know? So um, that can get tiring. It, it gets, I call it heavy lifting sometimes, you know, sometimes it's too, it, it gets a little exhausting. So for me, what was great is as I started being able to get to do these shows at La Mirada and around town, it was nice to go and do a scripted show, but still be able to put in that energy and that the creation of character that's the beauty of this interactive stuff that we do because my character is set. I'm not look, I don't look out my window and go, hey, give me a room in your house and give me three items that you wouldn't make pasta with, right? Our improv is I am who I am. You know, I have a name, I'm this guy, here's my history. But I look out the window and I'm like, hey, there's my cousin Vinny. Vinny, what's going on? How are you? And you have three different levels. People will be like, hey, what's going on? It's my cousin. To somebody who'll be like, mm -mm, don't talk to me. Right, right. I'm not playing. To somebody who'll stand there and just be like, hey, you know, different. Some people want to watch. Some people will kind of will answer. And some people want to be part of the cast. And that helps you with your creation. And that's your improv. Your improv comes from endowing other people with characters, endowing them with their creativity and their imagination. And you have the base of your history. This is your wife. There's no question as to what's going on here, but then everything else is up for grabs. Right. So it's a little bit different than what people think of, you know, for improv. When I was in New York, the greatest lesson I learned there, you know, there's a group Chicago city limits and I was a part of an offshoot of them. Uh, and because I come from an improv background, they were like, you can't be funny. You can't go for the joke anymore. We want you to do everything as realistic as possible. And it turned out to be some of the best work I've ever done and some of the funniest scenes we ever had. Yeah. I remember when I was taking Upright Citizens Brigade, you know, improv training there, that was one of the first things in 101. It's like, don't go for the joke. Don't go for the punchline. Right. Establish a character. And it could be an alien with wings. I mean, it can be outlandish, exactly. but but deliver the line, stay in character, stay in the scene as if an alien with wings would react. Don't go for those zany just because you can. Yeah, and, and, and it's even funnier and there's more heart to it. So I think that's helped me, but it's hard to say which I like better, you know? Depends on it's the day, hard. yeah. Because once you've done a lot of one, then you, you relish yeah. going to the other. Yeah, I love the challenge. And you know, I think, you know, I teach, I teach acting uh, and I do classes and stuff. And I've worked a lot with a lot of young people. And one of the things that I always think is the beauty of what we do as actors is that recreation of a, of a life, you know, eight times a week. 
And it has to be real every time because those people in the audience who paid $350 to see you, yeah. they don't know they don't know the story. They don't know what's going to happen next. And you have to play that character the same way, the realism, the honesty, the heart, the funny, the drama, as if it's never been said before, every single time. <laughs> and that challenge, that workout is what I love about it. So right. that opportunity to do a scripted show, to keep that fresh, but also grow with the character. You know, as we were doing Grumpy Old Men, we were all finding new different things to do. We were finding different fun relationships that we had with each other on stage. It didn't change the show, but it did create our our relationships grew on stage. Mm. And things became, there were some bits that we were doing that were like, oh, 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 boom. I'm one of those guys that like all the way until the end of a show, I'm still finding new things about my character. I'm Now, I'm not one of those actors that's going to, turn and give you something you're like what the hell was that I don't do that but I definitely will be like oh okay I'm gonna try this line this is the same line I've always been doing but you know what if I pick up this scone say the line and then pop the scone in my mouth that's gonna give it more importance and I remember doing that one time and all of the guys that were across from me looked at me and were like and afterwards they all came up to me and were like what the hell was that that was brilliant because we they just saw the, cre you know, and the same yeah. right back at them. They were all doing the same thing. That's what I'm talking about is like allowing yourself to grow with the character, but you don't, you don't change it. It's not like all of a sudden I'm British. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's, it's that interesting balance of, as you said, doing the same show, the same show that you do eight times, but newly each night. It's, it's that balance, but then also growing with it. I, I remember when I was doing the producer's, and Michael Kostroff, I, uh, I had him. Oh my on. God, I love him. I know. He, yeah, he, yeah, he was in the first season. And one of the things that I loved most about working with him is that from opening night all the way through to closing, he was constantly refining the jokes and figuring out the beats, the punchline, the, the way to deliver it in a different way and how he would deliver his performance on that particular night based upon the audience's reaction, but also based upon the actors that were with them. And it's that type of growth that really informs a show. And, you know, if you see a show opening night for closing night, there should be some growth, even though the same lines, the same blocking, there should be growth or richness of the characters. Yeah, I mean... One of the beautiful things about watching my brother do Hairspray was seeing him early on, like he originally got the gig in Vegas. Harvey Firestein had opened the show in Vegas and then Paul was the first one to take it over and take it to the end because it was supposed to run for a long time and ended up closing early. It was an amazing show, but it was only the 90 minute version, right? So seeing that, and he was so great at it. And um, the challenge for everybody was, they didn't know could Paul sustain the whole show on Broadway. So he did it in North Shore and that's what proved them that he could carry the show. And he went from North Shore, boom, onto Broadway. So seeing him on Broadway from the beginning and then seeing those last shows that he did, you know, and, and the guys that came in to play Wilbur, the different amazing talented men that came and worked with him. And every time they did that, you're special, right? You're special to me, is that the song? Whatever the duet is, I don't know. I didn't do the show. I don't have to know it. <laughs> God bless you, everybody who's involved, who's listening. Um, but, the duet, um, yes. The duet. Hysterical. Him and Jim Jim Bullock, one way, hysterical. Like, but each time it was different, but it was still the show. It was still Edna and Wilbur. It was still beautiful, touching, but different because he allowed himself to match the energy of his Wilbur's and his different Tracy's and the different, like, it was great to watch that growth. There's, they did a production of it out here in LA and I was asked to audition and I said I wouldn't do it. That is a role that I, I mean, I'm not trying to sound like, oh, I'm such an honorable man, but I'm not going to do that role. My brother, that's his role, man. And he established it, he earned it and he did it. Now I'll do Amos in a heartbeat. He don't own that. So if anybody wants, anybody listening <laughs> needs an Amos, I'm cheap. But as far as, as Edna goes, I'm, I'll never be able to touch it. But what I would love to do, again, going to one of these dream roll things was, I would love to be a Wilbur to his Edna. I've always Wouldn't thought that. would that be interesting? 
really interesting. Because they say that husbands and wives start looking like each other the longer they're together. So yeah. wouldn't that be interesting? I just think we would be really, really, I think we would be brilliant. Hello, I casting. Think we're amazing. Hello, Harvey. Harvey, do you hear me? Are you listening to this? <laughs> yeah, we have Harvey, Harvey Farstein and Ryan Murphy both listening. Oh, Thank nice. you. And well, Welcome and Michael Kostroff, look at Michael Kostroff. If we could get you to make a few calls, he's got to know somebody. He, he knows people. Hi, I know him. You know him. <laughs> Everybody I know knows Michael Costra. <laughs> he's like a placemat at a diner. Everyone has seen it. Yeah. Yeah. And gotten some food on it. Yeah. And drawn on it. Yeah. And a probably bit. tore it a little bit. To, just, just at the edges. Some gum. <laughs> some gum right on the corner. <laughs> And uh, I'm going to get a call from Michael Costa saying, did you just call me a placement with gum on it? No, no. I'll probably edit all this stuff out. No! <laughs> or send it to him personally. Right, right. I'll just say, this is what Peter had to say about you. Oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, this has been a joy to talk to you. Thank you so much for coming on the podcast. It's so great to reconnect with you. Same, same. So they had done this, I forget, the, like they did a production just prior to this show where they started this whole thing of the furs gone. Wait, 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 say that again, because you keep beeping. Would you shut I know, your, I don't shut know your beeps gonna, off? I don't know how to do it. It's is a new computer. <sighs> it's in the computer. I don't it can be, it get an email. Hello? I how do hello? I tell, hello? <laughs> Are you in my side of this box? <laughs> is this a box you're in? <laughs> oh my goodness! I don't know. You're, I, you're messed up. Well, you know what? If it, we'll let it be. But if it bongs, just repeat the sentence again and, and continue. All on. right. I'm just trying to figure out. Like, is this something I turn off? Yeah, is it's it... a notification setting. But I I don't know where you are on your computer or your skill of finding things. So I don't. Where is <laughs> no, this is great for the show because this is exactly what people need to understand. That we see. It just oh, see, there it is. Well, okay. also, you're just too popular. That there's that. No, too. no, I'm telling you, you know what it is? It's Bed Bath and Beyond sending me stuff. <laughs> <laughs> it's um, why do you want those notifications though? I don't. That's what I'm saying. Is it's a new computer that I haven't finished setting up. Love it. And um, Love it. I get these stupid things, and it's so funny because I get these dumb emails, and then I remember a friend of mine seeing one that was for like Wayfair. <laughs> he turns to me, he goes. Do we need to stop everything so you can reply to Wayfair and tell Wayfair. them how you're doing? Right, exactly. Oh my gosh. Okay, I think I you're put it on sleep.